If the police still follow every lead that comes in and follow it to its end, one of these days we're going to find out because somebody knows. She headed off and we said our goodbyes and kissed goodbye and had no idea that that would be the last time we would see our daughter. With all their personal belongings there, their purses, their jewelry, uh, obviously at that point you think something is uh, wrong. There was no signs of struggle inside the house at all. And how it went down from there is almost impossible. Someone had to take complete control of those three persons. With 5,000 plus leads at the time, it's very difficult to triage which ones uh, you need to focus on. And 25 years is unbelievable. It's that, you know, we never, we have no answers. phone messages of concern that would grow into fear on the night of June 7, 1992. That night, 18-year-old Stacy McCall and 19-year-old Susie Streeter graduated from Kickapoo High School. And after all of the graduation stuff, we went out to eat. And then Stacy went home with us and she immediately started changing clothes. And I said, wait, you can't change clothes yet. We've got pictures out back. Stacy would oblige her mother's photo request, then met up with Streeter so the two could attend planned parties to celebrate graduation. After making several stops, the girls returned to Streeter's home that she shared with her mother, Cheryl Lovett. But from that night on, Lovett, Streeter, and McCall would never be heard from again. We had no idea there was a crime scene there. You don't know that, you don't expect it. You're looking for your daughter and trying to find out what happened. and Janice McCall recalls going to Lovett's home 25 years ago, finding the purses of all three women. There was no sign of a struggle, only a broken glass bulb over the front porch light. Police believe the three women went missing sometime between 2.30 a.m. and 8 a.m. I remember when the police department came up and two officers came in, and I explained what was going on. And I walked them through the house and explained what was going on there. So the officers said, well, we're going to go outside and discuss this and look around a little bit. When they came back in, they said, we're going to file this as a missing persons case, foul play suspected. Janice McCall immediately began calling radio and TV stations to spread the word about the missing women. No one has seen 47-year-old Cheryl Levitt, her daughter, 19-year-old Suzanne Streeter, or Suzanne's friend, 18-year-old Stacy McCall, for more than 48 hours. She made posters with pleas to help bring the women home. I don't remember if it was that day or that night or the next day that the crime scene van was pulled in front of Susie and Cheryl's house and that yellow tape was taped off and different things saying crime scene and not to enter. From that day on, Janice McCall and her family were in constant contact with police, tracking down leads and fielding phone calls with tips that would most often lead nowhere. I remember the different calls that said they would see him. They said they had seen Stacy driving a little red sports car down Battlefield. Well, it wasn't Stacy, it was Lisa, our oldest daughter. I remember calls that said that they were cut up into pieces. I remember one that said they were fed to the hogs, you know, horrifying things for a mom to hear. McCall went on to establish a network called One Missing Link. It aimed to help other families with a missing loved one. It's not as active today and she doesn't visit the police station as much anymore either. But just as she has for all these years. Stacy's my daughter and I want her back. She still holds out hope that one day we might learn the truth about what really happened to Springfield's three missing women. If the police still follow every lead that comes in and follow it to its end, one of these days we're going to find out because somebody knows. You know, the only thing my gut can say is that three women are missing. They disappeared without a trace. 
I have no idea where they went, who took them. You know, I would love it, absolutely love it, if they called me, if one of them called me. It's a case that received national attention. Have the police given you any theories on what might have happened to Stacy? A mystery that even decades later, people are still talking about. Everybody involved in this case wanted it resolved. Former prosecuting attorney Daryl Moore was one of dozens of investigators who spent days, sleepless nights, and hundreds of hours trying to solve this case. Today, he still has hope the answer so many have worked and prayed for will come. Through the years, there have been various leads, but it got to the point where even today I still get calls from people. Moore acknowledges it has been frustrating. There wasn't one rock they didn't overturn. They had to take every tip seriously. Many leads, none were solid. There was a dig over in Webster County because there was a rumor that they had been taken by a certain person, abused, chopped up, and spread in a creek or spread in a cave, and there were searches over there. Early on, there were tips about a green van. This is a vehicle that was seen in the area of 1717 East Del Mar. Police received a tip from a woman who claims she saw a van being driven by a woman she thought was Susie Streeter the morning of the disappearance and heard a man yelling at the driver, telling her to get out of there. Police searched thousands of vans. They posted the model all over the media, even painted one green and kept it outside the police department. Tips about the van and missing women kept flooding in. I was appointed special prosecutor in Barry County because of a lead the Highway Patrol had received and we there was a dig down there on a property um, that at the time seemed promising. It, it seemed to fit certain facts that we thought we knew at the time. I just felt like we were given the case when we actually got it late. We didn't start from the very beginning. Retired Springfield Police Sergeant David Asher was one of the lead investigators. He worked alongside Ron Worsham, also with SPD. First, we looked at, uh, at her brother because there had been some uh, problems there somewhere that I don't know if it's true or false. Worsham is talking about Bart Streeter, Susie's brother. His alibi at the time of the disappearance apparently checked out. Then there was a tip that the women were buried under the south parking lot of Cox Hospital. It was under construction soon after the disappearance. A theory Daryl Moore says had no credible evidence. In the first place, it's based on some woman who says there's a psychic dog who says that they may be there. Then somebody did run a device over it indicating that there were some anomalies. But when you talk to them, as people may remember at the time, of course it's been years ago, uh, that was bulldozed to prepare the parking garage for the cement and the building of the garage. Well, part of the debris left out there is remains of trees and stumps. Then there's Robert Craig Cox, a man released from a Florida prison on a trial technicality. He had been convicted of killing a woman in Florida, but was free and in Springfield at the time the women disappeared. He stirred up a lot of interest. I mean, there was some concern that he was playing people just to be transported back here and get out of prison for a bit. And Dustin Reckla was a former acquaintance of Susie Streeter. She was about to testify against him on charges he broke into a mausoleum to steal gold from the deceased. Police were very interested in Reckla and two accomplices, but their hope quickly faded. And once you cleared those persons, they, they were actually, I guess, persons of interest. Uh, we were kind of left out with no suspects at that point in time. While many of the leads turned up false, they still hold out hope the right tip could be developed even 25 years later. I wish we had solved that case back then, but I pray daily that this case is solved before I leave this world. I won't have to get up to glory to see the girls to find out what happened.
Retired Springfield Police Sergeant David Asher helped lead the investigation into the disappearance of Cheryl Levitt, her daughter Susie Streeter, and Susie's friend Stacy McCall. Just days into their disappearance, Asher's team was tasked with finding answers. Many detectives are still searching for today. My team and I worked days and nights and uh, many, many hours. Uh, we were overwhelmed. We were confronted with issues that we had never been confronted with before. Some of those challenges are well known. Among them, one of the most important pieces of any case, the condition of the crime scene. In the hours leading up to police being contacted, family members and friends were inside the home trying to make sense of the situation. I'm not blaming anybody. Uh, you know, a family is concerned they're going to do everything they can do. And anytime you go into a crime scene, you take something in. When you leave the crime scene, you take something out. Ron Warsham was the deputy police chief in 1992. He says early on, the department threw everyone and everything at the case. In those days, DNA evidence wasn't used, but detectives did use a fumigating technique to pull fingerprints from the home. And of course, we had thousands of prints at that point in time. We didn't have the automatic fingerprint system at that time. So the only way fingerprints really do you any good back then is if you had a suspect to compare them to. There were also thousands of tips that poured in from the community. Uh, every tip that came in, you couldn't afford not to check it out because any tip could have been credible. Investigators went to great and at times unconventional links following some of those leads. A person was called who claimed to be able to communicate with the dog that was left behind. A woman who provided information about a green van seen in the area was hypnotized and investigators managed to track a phone call from the show America's Most Wanted to a store in Louisiana. And that person actually fit sort of the description of some information we had that could have been involved in the abduction. Uh, that person was going to call back and never did. Going to the public for help is always a double-edged sword for police. While the media can help get word out to a large audience in a short amount of time, it also means those being interviewed by detectives, especially those close to the case, are aware of the latest information. It just gets a lot out there to where, again, detectives maybe might be hindered and stuff in their abilities to, to solve it or to, to follow up on leads properly. Springfield Police Captain Greg Higdon brought a fresh set of eyes to the case in 2001. It's very intimidating. I mean, there were, uh, at that time, uh, 5,000 plus leads. Uh, going in a variety of different directions. Higdon spent time re-interviewing family members and friends and coming through evidence. Before his promotion in 2006, he had filed more than 400 new reports on the case. There were some that came in that were, were good leads. Uh, other, again, other leads were maybe not a lot of information, uh, maybe a sighting or maybe uh, I think this person might have done it or that person might have done it, uh, but not much to go on. I think we did everything we probably could. But you never know what you might have missed. That's, that's always in the back of your mind. Warsham says in later years, as sheriff of Webster County, he still followed leads on the missing women. And even in his retirement, as he hears of other missing person cases, many of the memories come back. I think about this case every day, today. And back in June the 7th, 1992 is when it started. Each investigator has their own theory, only parts of which they are willing to share. I firmly believe that one of them was being stalked for some time before the crime ever com was committed. I personally feel like we have talked to that person or persons responsible. And while the answers are still unknown, investigators agree someone out there has the missing pieces. I will tell you that every person on the department when I was there, I retired in 95, will be thrilled and everyone involved in this case since then will be ecstatic that it would be resolved. Today, if that had happened, it would have been out that evening, all over the news media. It would be completely different if it happened today. If, if it was on the social media with the three missing women, it's gone all over the world.
From the time that they left the party at Battlefield, somewhere around 2 o'clock in the morning, uh, their vehicle is found at uh, noon, basically, uh, at the Del Mar address. Current Laclede County Sheriff David Millsap started with the Springfield Police Department a year and a half after that fateful day in 1992. I really truly believe it's the case that haunts the Springfield Police Department. He led a comprehensive review of the case, including over 25,000 documents just three years ago. The conclusion is one that still runs cold. No one has seen 47-year-old Cheryl Levitt, her daughter, 19-year-old Suzanne Streeter, or Suzanne's friend, 18-year-old Stacy McCall, for more than 48 hours. This is one of those tragic tales where a case just hasn't been solved and you hope for the best because the, the family certainly deserves that. Millsap is not one to make excuses as to why the case has not been solved, although he did point out a couple of holes in the investigation. Of course, hindsight is always 2020. He said that it's often a fallacy that a big task force can get the job done. While sometimes that is successful, it also can open the door to a botched crime scene. It's too many hands that can stir the pot. He also cited technological restrictions. They didn't have cell phones back then. Well, at least not what we're used to today. They also didn't have social media like Facebook. Really, the technological age was just an infant, which begs the question, how would this case have been different if it were to happen today? The first thing that investigators start looking for would be those digital footprints. We've all heard of privacy concerns in recent years. Things like IP addresses and cell phone towers. They're trackable by detectives. But Dr. Shannon McMurtry with Drury University explains that it's actually accessible to just about everyone. If you post on social media, if you take a picture and share that on the internet and it has that IP address, then we can deduce where you've been. He pointed out a quick search on a free website, socialbearing.com. With a few clicks of the mouse, here's a view of all the Twitter activity within downtown Springfield over the last three days. Each of those triangles represent a different tweet and can be filtered down to individual users. Uh, when you ask most people are they concerned about their privacy, they'll tell you they're really not, especially younger generation, they, they really don't care. But then when you start showing them how much of their privacy they're giving up without realizing it, they start to care. An advantage they did not have 25 years ago. Stacy, call home. Call home and let us know that you're okay. Back then you couldn't even track local telephone calls. Uh, you had to have a trap on the phone so somebody can make a call locally. There was no way to trace that call. In today's day and age, it's nearly impossible to escape a digital fingerprint. Have you ever walked out of the work only for your phone to beep at you and say it's going to take around 20 minutes to get home? Or maybe you're walking downtown, your phone beeps and says, hey, you looking for your car? Because I remember where you parked it. That's because our phones have been following us. They've been tracking us every step on our journey together. Don't worry, it's not some rogue software that was downloaded in the background, or some crazy app that you need to go ahead and uninstall. In fact, it comes standard on almost every single phone. And here's the scary part. You accepted those terms and conditions, most likely when you turned on the phone for the first time. It really drove the way we handle major cases and the way we thought about things. And I can remember several instances where I would have a, a missing persons case as a patrol sergeant and think about, I need to be doing things the right way right off the beginning. The ending starts with the beginning of the case and the things that we do in the very beginning often uh, is how the case will turn out. Even 25 years later, it's, it's hard. Girls are still missing, and I really have empathy with the family, you know, or both families for that matter. Have you guys been tempted to take it down at any point? No, I, you know, we're going to leave it as long as there's, it's still unsolved. The faces of Cheryl Levin, her daughter Susie Streeter, and Streeter's high school friend Stacy McCall have been preserved in photographs and videos for the past 25 years. Stacy Kathleen McCall. <laughs> And today, whether it's through a blog dedicated to their return or an article in a magazine recounting their disappearance, like this one, recently published by Kickapoo High School, Streeter and McCall's alma mater, it's clear these photographs are still penetrating the community's memory. 
Another spot those faces can be found today years and years and years is here at Coyote Adobe's Bar and Cafe in Springfield. It hung right in that spot for 25 years. Bar owner Dave Bauer uh, knows the poster hanging in his front window has seen day better days. Uh, we had it laminated. It's, it's an ugly piece of paper, but it's an ugly deal. But taking it down, well, that would mean breaking a promise. Maybe the second day after it happened. One he made a quarter century ago to Stacy McCall's mom, Janice. Janice came by and she dropped off a flyer and she asked me if I'd hang it in the window. And, uh, God, she... Anyway. Um, I told her, I said, um, you know, I'll leave it up till they come back. And Bauer's not alone. You see, there are still so many people across this entire state perplexed by this case. As for why, well, one former prosecutor says it's hard not to get fixated on such a frustrating lack of answers. With no idea of who did it, how it was done, or where they were taken, I mean, it's totally an exceptional event. At the time of the women's disappearance, Daryl Moore was a chief assistant prosecutor in Greene County. Of course, since then, it's disturbed and rightfully disturbed people for the last quarter century. These days, he travels the state as a special prosecutor, finding one commonality in every place he goes. I go out uh, to other counties, judges, lawyers, defense lawyers, prosecutors, or even people still ask me, do you have, you know, what's the inside scoop? And I have to tell them, I don't have an inside scoop. And while sheer curiosity and shock play a role here, Moore says another factor is certainly fear. And then I think in the back of many people's minds are could it happen to me? The randomness of it. I think that's that scared people then, and it scares people today. Not just fear related to what happened. Even 25 years later, it's it's hard. I don't even know them. But also the fear of what could happen. I wouldn't get rid of it. It just, um, if it saved one girl coming in here and looking at that picture and going, um, you know, I'd better be safe tonight. And maybe worst of all, fear that we'll never see more of these women than just their photographs. Hopefully it'll be gone. That would be my hope is that after all this time, somebody will, will say something that's the truth. our two young ladies, and we know that Stuart and Janice McCall are also hurting terribly. And we were in, on a roller coaster that would go up and down and up and down, and that roller coaster would say, we think we have them. 25 years later, there is no sign of the women and no known suspect. For the families of the missing women, coping with the disappearance over the years has changed them. Janice McCall and her husband, Stuart, have grandchildren today. We became even more protective of our family. Uh, I still don't want my daughters going shopping, even if it's at the mall or Walmart or whatever, by themselves. Early on, Janice stayed in constant contact with investigators, posted flyers, received phone calls at her home, some hateful, others seemingly helpful. Cheryl's sister and Susie's aunt, Debbie Schwartz, lives in Arizona. It was very hard for us, and it was hard for us because we weren't there. So we felt like, gosh, you know, we aren't doing like what Janice could do. Deb told us she still has a lot of anger. Living with no answers and no sign of their loved ones has taken its toll on her family. Her mother and father have since passed. He was 75 when he died, and I think he'd had a lot longer life without that stress. It, I think it, it ate in him. And um, being a father and knowing that in his mind he failed to protect his daughter or to bring it to any kind of conclusion was, um, it was, it was very hard. It's very hard for all of us. We can't do anything. There's, there's 
nothing we can do. Deb and Janice both are aware of the many possibilities as to what may have happened and who could have done it. Both come back to one man as a likely suspect, Robert Craig Cox. He was convicted of killing a woman in Florida, but was released on a trial technicality. He was in Springfield at the time of the disappearance. He was fully capable of doing it. He had a uh, he was actually, he had worked with the same place that my husband worked at Reliable Chevrolet. Jenna said he very well could have seen Stacy when she and her sisters would visit their father at work. Well, Cox is probably the most um, logical choice. There's so many ways that he fits, you know. Um, and he's pretty much of a sociopath from the interviews I've seen. With all the emotional suffering the families have endured the past 25 years, it's their faith that has helped guide them through. I, I'm just, I, I take comfort in believing that my dad is with Cheryl and Susie and knows what happens now, you know, what happened and that they're in, that they're in heaven, they're in a happy place and better place in this world. And my mom's there too. I do have a good relationship with God. And I know that in his own time, he'll let me know. It might be long after I've gone. You know, it's, it's, his time can be a blink of an eye and it can be 25 years. So maybe he's only blinked once and it might take that second blink. And then it became years. And five years after it happened, there were you know, we were doing stories about how it had been five years and this is all that has gone on in the past five years and we still have no idea what happened to these women. more people that we can make aware of the situation we're faced with, the better chance we have of somebody coming forward with solid knowledge of the circumstances. I think most journalists who were here working and have worked throughout the years on, on this story, they, they probably have spent time thinking at night about it. You know, you wake up at three in the morning, especially during that time, and you're like, where are they? That was a Monday morning, and I was uh, working at KTTS, and I was doing traffic reports. I worked here. I was producing. I was, uh, must have been day side, because the memory that sticks out for me is the morning meeting. Uh, but I was in the newsroom um, at the news leader. As I was driving around that morning, I heard one of the officers say, the porch light's broken out. Something wasn't right. We heard something on the scanner that indicated there was something going on at that location on Delmar. I was there shortly after 8 and started getting this information together and I think we went on the air with it at 8.30. Our news director at the time, Steve Snyder, uh, immediately brought this up as one of our potential stories for that day and said, what is going on? I'm hearing something about three women who haven't shown up they're missing from a house in Springfield and they're just gone. And they were gone in such unusual circumstances. You wouldn't expect, um, I think having the mom being one of the two people dis who, who disappeared was part of the unusualness about the story. Um, and the girls having just come off of what was one of the happiest nights of their life probably. They just graduated, they'd been partying, they'd been enjoying the evening with their friends. They had plans for the next day. They were expected to be someplace the next day, and it, it just didn't look good. It didn't look good that there was um, no explanation for why they would have left behind their purses, their, their keys, their money, um, their cigarettes. Uh, smokers don't do that. I can't imagine if it's like one person who took them, how did they take three people without leaving anything that connected them? The cars in the driveway. Their their belongings, um, their clothes. It, it, that was what really was so scary. And then it just took off from there. In the days that followed, it became a much bigger story as, as things kept 
going on and on, and there was no, nothing to explain this, this bizarre, mysterious disappearance. In the first week or so, you really thought it was just going to resolve. Um, it was going to have an ending of some sort, and it didn't. It's the craziest story. Um, and it went on forever. Weeks went by, and eventually years, and every anniversary since that time, you know, we do the one year, the five year, the 10 year, and um, it just keeps going. The thing that's just boggling even now is that we don't have any answers at all. I mean, they had 24, 25,000 pieces of documents in the case file. They had so many leads, thousands of leads, thousands of tips, all those people working on them. They've had FBI experts and some very smart people all over the country examine that case. And we had all the, the tips about the van, the tips about every disturbed pile of dirt in southwest Missouri became suspicious to somebody. It's, and it's gone nowhere. They vanished. How do three people vanish? And that's what continues to keep people's attention on this. I can remember bylines by Tracy Bauer and um, Chris Clark and Chris Bentley and Debbie Barnes and all the people who were working in the newspaper back in the 90s eventually got involved in it and, and uh, it touched almost everyone. Who would ever think I'd still be talking about a, a crime like this, a case like this, a quarter of a century later. It's just crazy. Just watching that family agonize and grasp for whatever they can just to get some resolution, um, that's with every story, I think. I think all of us watch families hurt and journalists feel that. We feel their pain and watching her hurt has not been easy, has not been easy for anybody. Um, I want something to end on this so that she can breathe and her husband can breathe. I, I want their family to, to know something. That would be the ending, regardless of what it is. Just to know would help. We all want to know what happened. Those women have become our women. Still, it's still under investigation. The case is, uh, has never been put into a cold case status or anything of that nature. It's always been an active investigation. Don't, don't discount the good detective work that was done way before us. Uh, that's always good and that's always important to, uh, to review that. Uh, and to take what you can from that and either learn from it or move forward with maybe possibly following up on additional leads that came from that information. It's real. It happened in Springfield, Missouri. Three women, Cheryl Levitt, her daughter Susie Streeter, and Susie's friend Stacy McCall, simply vanished from a Springfield home. It is a mystery. Nobody knows what really happened. What's likely become the city's most perplexing case began on June 7th, 1992. Now, over the years, several people have been interviewed about the mystery. Is hoping some new tip will lead to a break in the case. And since then, it's like the same story has been told. We haven't found her daughter. We haven't found Susie. We haven't found Cheryl. Criminal investigation. And even 25 years later. It's still under investigation. Sergeant Todd King with the Springfield Police Department says they still receive tips. Two to three a month. I think what it tells you is the community cares about the case. And every time the phone rings. You're always hopeful that that's the tip that's going to going to push you in the right direction or lead you down the right trail. He's currently working on the case and says it's always been an active investigation. Most of the time it's reviewing all of the old information and the old things that the other detectives that have come before them have done. In hopes that with more technology and a fresh set of eyes, some new lead will come up. So you, what you do is you have detectives that go back and you look at those tips and see what was done on them before with the new twists that might come in with with a tip that they they look into that that angle on it or they may go back and re-interview 
old witnesses to see if they remember things from back then or things that they failed to talk to the officers about. It's there and it's there every day since 1992. This poster with the women's photo has been here at the Coyote Adobe Bar and Cafe for as long as the women have been missing. Through these reportings, these milestone years that we hear about it. You know, we hear it 20 years, we hear it at 15, we hear it at 10 and 25. Now we're at 25. We'll look at it and they comment about it. And not so much anymore because there are a lot of people don't know and don't understand about it. And, and it's because it was so long ago. Many lives. My cook wasn't even born yet. A case that now a quarter of a century old is touching across generations. And throughout the years, many theories have come across detectives' desks. Anybody that really truly wants that one theory over another to be the case, uh, they can make it fit. The reality is when you start trying to look at putting evidence with the theories and matching things up to make them where they're a vi maybe a person is a viable suspect, we just don't have that right now. Investigators who worked on this case say they are honored to have been trusted with a case that shook and still haunts a community. For me personally, like I said, I was proud uh, to be able to work on that case. Uh, I was humbled uh, that uh, they wanted me to take a look at it and, and kind of see uh, from a different angle, maybe different, again, fresh set of eyes. The memories of the three women are still very real among their families, the police department and this community. And everyone may have their own theories of what happened. But one thing they all have in common is there's still hope that someday what could be described as the perfect crime will be solved. I'm hopeful and very optimistic that this case will be solved at some point. Somebody out there hopefully will eventually say, you know, it's time. I got, I got to let this go. It's time for us to have some results. If you know anything or think you know anything, call the Springfield Police Department. If in the past you've done that and nobody's contacted you, do it again and again because one of you, someone, knows something. And we can't. No police department can succeed without your involvement. Janice McCall, Stacy's mother, believes there will never really be closure. But she, like so many others, still hold on to hope that someone, someday, will speak up. I don't have to know who it is. I just want the answers of where the three messy women are. Yeah. That's all. But he won't forget and keep their faces out there and their names and hope that we get the answers we want. I remember one day I was barbecuing in the backyard, and I was using a charcoal grill. And I said, Stacy, I'm out of lighter fluid. Will you go get me some? She said, sure, Dad. I'll go get you some. And uh, she went off to the store. And anyway, guess what she brought back? <laughs> I've had this for 25 years. As for Cheryl, my vision of her has always been perfect hair, generally always being put together. Susie didn't seem to mind and included me and was nice and I was gracious that we invited her personal space which was a lot for a 17 year old. Probably what I'm the most thankful for is we do have those memories and we can share those memories. This is just to let them know how much we love them. That no matter where they are they're going to know of our wishes for them and of our love. I think this is my last candlelight vigil this time. I don't plan on doing another one. This is all I can handle, 25 years.